Coming up on this month's City Scene, we're going to learn about a couple of construction projects that are beginning on the city's west side. We're going to learn about the Levitt at the Falls and what it's all about, and we're going to celebrate May being National Bike Month. Hi everyone, I'm Michelle Wellman and welcome to May City Scene. Up first is Shannon Austin giving us an update on some of the city's west side road construction projects. Hi Sioux Falls, guess what? Construction season is finally full swing ahead. I'm Shannon Austin and I'm gonna give you an update today on what's going on on the west side of the city. We're out here right now on Ellis Road from 41st Street up to about Stony Creek. And we welcome to the show John Heck, who's our project engineer. John, welcome to the show. Thanks, Shannon. Okay, so we have a lot of stuff going on out here. What's just a general overview of what the contractor is working on right now on Ellis Road? Right now, they're working on phase one with the grading from 26th Street to Lancaster. In the next day or so, they'll start with the 24-inch water main installation okay. and then proceed with the other utilities. So Ellis Road is closed then from where to where right now? Right now it's closed from 26th to Lancaster. Okay. Uh, 32nd Street is open to across it at this time. In two to three weeks time, 32nd Street will get closed. They have 25 working days to complete that intersection and reopen it. And then you'll start to see Lancaster and the stretch of Ellis Road to the south get closed with that reopening by August 15th. Okay, so for those drivers that used to drive on Ellis Road, explain, so there's a lot of grading because it used to be a county highway and then kind of explain what happens when we go from an old county highway to an urban street. Yeah, when we go from that situation to an urban street, generally the road gets widened out and also gets lowered down. So there's okay. quite a bit of heavy grading involved and that's the reason for the full closure. The closure. How, have, how have the property owners been so far? Because there's not a lot of immediate adjacent property owners that go out onto Ellis Road. How are they getting access to their properties? Uh, the ones that have um, just single access off of Ellis Road, uh, the contractor is required to provide temporary access roads. Okay. Uh, those, of course, were a challenge with the recent snowstorms, but the okay. contractor coordinated and we did a pretty good job of keeping those people with access. Okay. So with this project being so long, are there any special challenges that we typically wouldn't see on a, on a quote-unquote normal construction project? Well, probably the biggest challenge is just getting the majority of the work done in one season okay. or whatever. And we've called for having the road back open by this fall. Okay. There will be some carryover work, finish work in the spring of 2019. Okay, so that would probably just be like the seating and the grass and, okay. And so this, this particular section is a four lane with a median section, is that right? That's correct. And, and what kind of median treatments are, is it a concrete median or is it a grass it's, median? It's a narrow median, typically six foot wide, okay. narrower at the intersections and it is just being uh, paved with concrete, a colored concrete. Okay. Are there then sidewalks along both both sides of the corridor? Yes, there's actually this corridor will have two eight foot side paths on each side to promote the pedestrians plus handle the bicycle traffic. Yeah, there certainly are a lot of residential homes that are popping up adjacent to the corridor. There's quite a bit, especially to the west here. You yeah. don't realize it. Has there been any challenges with the public involvement? I mean, is it is it just a kind of a just getting people east and west? to their destinations? That's, it's been mainly east and west to the destinations. Everything has gone quite well. Um, like I say, the neighbors and residents along here have really been quite cooperative with the project and see the need for the project. Oh, great. So we are still on the west side on Madison Street from Louise Avenue, just about to Kiwanis. And we have a lot of construction going on behind us. We welcome to the show Kenny from HR Green, welcome. So, what is our contractor doing behind us right now? Uh, right now, they are doing rock excavation for installation of the new 12-inch ductile iron water main. So, are they going to have to blast the rock? Um, we are anticipating having to blast the rock for the water main, and uh, we're currently drilling, prepping to do a blast today for okay. the storm sewer install. So after the water main then, what, what ultimately are we building out here? Are we widening it out at all? We are widening the roadway to four lanes okay. through on Madison and uh, 
three lanes on Louise going north from Madison Louise intersection. Okay, so right now Madison's completely closed off, right? Madison Street is completely closed off uh, th for through traffic, yes. Okay, so everybody detours around to Russell Street. So any, any um, helpful advice for our drivers that you'd like to give? Uh, just if you're coming through the construction zone, just pay attention to uh, construction traffic and please slow down and... Uh, All right, well we'll be back in about a month to check on your progress. Well, it should be good. Thanks, Shannon. We've been hearing a lot about this Levitt at the Falls project. Up next, we're going to learn all about it. Yeah, it really started out with a conversation that I had with Tom Dempster back in 2011, where he and Tim Bow, a former Washington High School uh, graduate uh, who was living out in California and experienced these Levitt concerts, and really recommended to Tom that, you know, you should take a look at it here in Sioux Falls. And so we started that conversation back in 2011. And uh, ultimately, we brought the executive director of the uh, Levitt Foundation uh, to Sioux Falls to look at site selection to see if we had a venue and a location that would work for a Levitt Pavilion. And what was cool about it, it, before she left to go back to L.A., she said, you're already approved, your site is approved, and that site was here at Falls Park West. Sioux Falls is an ideal match for the Levitt program. It's a growing community and it's a diverse community. And Levitt is all about building community through music, bringing people of all backgrounds, of all ages together to celebrate community as one. And here in Sioux Falls with the diverse community, how it's growing, and most importantly, it's a community that supports the arts and supports community building efforts. We knew this would be a great place where a Levitt venue would thrive. And so since that time, uh, we spent a lot of time uh, working on uh, cost estimating some designs of uh, Falls Park West. And then we entered into a three-party agreement between the Friends of Levitt Shell Sioux Falls, which is the local nonprofit, the City of Sioux Falls, and the National Levitt Foundation uh, to form this partnership to bring uh, the Levitt to Sioux Falls. There's been overwhelming excitement and support from the community. Um, we wouldn't be here today where we are without you know, so many people in the community pulling together to make this um, event a reality. We broke ground obviously on the, on the property and uh, we're just excited to get the project started. Well the Levitt Shell and Performance Grounds will be, built, will be built directly behind me and this is an area of Falls Park we identify as Falls Park West. The project itself is going to last approximately one year and has already begun. So our goal is to complete construction by April of 2019 and begin performances later that summer. When the Levitt venue comes to life, people can expect to experience high caliber entertainment of all music genres and cultural celebrations. Truly, every Levitt concert will be a great experience for the whole family and for the community to come together and see stellar entertainment. I think one of the really cool things about it is, one, it's free and everybody's welcome. Uh, Falls Park has always been a location where uh, no matter um, where you came from, what language you speak, the color of your skin, whatever it might be, uh, you're always welcome in Falls Park. And we see that with the Fourth of July Parade and Picnic and a lot of the other festivals that we have. And that was one of the things that was really critical for the Levitt Foundation is to make sure that the site that we chose for our Levitt was very welcoming uh, for everybody. And, uh, we really think this is gonna be a great location for us. We've got uh, a multi-phase plan for Falls Park uh, West, and one of the things that we'll be doing is this first phase with the Levitt Shell, the event lawn, uh, the walkways, the landscaping, and uh, really everything we need to be able to host the Levitt events. But there are additional acres uh, to the north all the way up to the railroad tracks that where we could see maybe one or two more phases uh, that would ultimately build out all 13 acres here in Falls Park West. One of the things that we heard from the National Levitt uh, Foundation was that wherever these Levitts have been constructed, it's just been a catalyst for development in and around uh, those Levitt sites. And uh, I think we're already seeing it here, uh, the development that's happening uh, uh, now, uh, adjacent to the Falls Park West and the, the new Levitt Shell location, uh, and what's planned for the future with the Cascades Project, Sioux Seal redevelopment, and the stuff that's already happened, and we've just barely broke ground on the property, uh, I think it's just going to be a hotbed of activity. Uh, it's going to be transformational for downtown for all of Sioux Falls. And really think it's also going to be a regional draw for folks to come in uh, from outlying areas and really enjoy the concerts as well. Oh, I cannot wait for our first concert season where we see people from all over Sioux Falls and whether they've lived in town for one week or all their life coming together to really Sioux Falls' living room and enjoying the power of live outdoor music.
Can't wait to see that. Speaking of parks, up next is Jackie Nelson giving us an update on our latest 80 and 18 park. I'm Jackie Nelson with Sioux Falls Park and Recreation here to talk to you about our 2018 ongoing event for residents of Sioux Falls called 80 and 18. 80 and 18 is a challenge to residents and visitors of Sioux Falls to visit 80 parks throughout 2018. So each month we feature seven to eight different parks. We encourage folks to go out, take a selfie of themselves within of the park that's featured for the month next to a landmark or some, some feature within the park that they're enjoying and then submit it to us via social media, Facebook or Twitter, or to drop off their pictures at the Sioux Falls Parks office. Today we are at Tut Hill Park and to tell you a little bit more about the features and amenities Tut Hill has to offer, I'd like to introduce District Park Supervisor Rich Carlson. All right, today we're at uh, Tut Hill Park located on uh, South Cliff Avenue in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. It's 94 acres located right, al right along the Big Sioux River. Um, some of the features that you're going to find at Tut Hill Park include uh, two playgrounds. One of them is brand new, installed in 2017. There are two picnic shelters, one on the lower half and one in the upper part of the park. It also features a formal garden that has over 7,300 annual plants that we'll be planting here later in the month. And it also features over 200 perennial flowers and plants in the formal garden. The formal garden is a great place for family pictures and for weddings. It also includes a house that's available for rentals for birthday parties, weddings, uh, family reunions, any type, any type of meeting that uh, uh, people might have, uh, we have the house available. Um, also during the warmer months coming up, uh, you'll notice more hot air balloons launching from Tut Hill Park. It's a very popular location for that in Sioux Falls. Um, and then there's wildlife uh, out here. Um, and during the winter months, uh, Tut Hill is available for uh, sledding and for ice skating. Another feature that we have at Tut Hill Park is uh, disc golf. We have 18 holes throughout the park at different levels, so come out and enjoy those f features at Tut Hill. We're downtown Sioux Falls, and joining me next is Jessica Sexy, and we're going to talk about this colorful thing that I am standing on, and pretty soon there's going to be a lot more of these throughout the city. Hi, Jessica. Hi. Hi. Let's talk a little bit about this. This one has been here for a while. What is it? Yes, yeah, so this one was painted last year. This is part of our Storm Drain Inlet Art Painting Project. Okay. This is the third year for the project, and what we do is we put a call out, call for art out to the community, and we ask artists to submit designs to us uh, with messages about water quality to actually be painted on these storm drains. Okay, so when you say artists, yes. what qualifies as an art? Is it kids? Is it adult? What, what yeah. is an artist? Anybody who's passionate about water quality can be one of our artists. Uh, we've had submissions from all over the community. One of our storm drains is actually dedicated for a student or a, or a kid under 18. I love that. So you can definitely be, you know, under the under 18 and be one of our artists. Um, but the other four are, are any other artists throughout the community. So when you say other four. Sure. Okay, now we were talking. So there's five right now. Yep. And then these are going to stay downtown. Yes. So they're going to be five new ones? Yep, there's going to be five new ones this year. Uh, five were painted last year. We had a few painted the year before too. They're okay. scattered all around downtown. But this year we're mixing it up and we're letting our artists pick their inlet. So we're going to spread them throughout Sioux Falls. Let's talk a little bit about you know what a, a storm drain inlet is? Sure, yes. Yeah, so storm drains, you probably drive by them, walk past them, maybe don't even give them a second thought. And that's what this project is all about. We want to raise awareness and draw the public's attention to these. They're vital to our infrastructure. They help keep us safe. They get our you know, rainwater out of here quickly, um, but they also lead directly to the river. So anything that goes down these storm drains is gonna end up in our river. That's pet waste, litter, automotive oh chemicals, oh anything. Oh my gosh. Yes. So that's a big message. Right. So, yeah. Oh my goodness. Yeah. So not uh, put your waste where it belongs. Right. Oh my God, what a lesson not to litter. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Oh. Yeah, we do our river cleanup every year. We see litter, um, you know, because these storm drains, they do lead direct to, directly to the river. And I think a lot of people don't realize that. So we're trying to draw awareness, get people's attention so that they realize um, that 
storm, stormwater pollution is a big source of pollution for the, for the Big Sioux River, but we can help by keeping these clear. What is the difference between what this is and what a sewer is? Yes. It sounds so different. Right, that's a great question. So a storm sewer, we, we used to call these storm sewers, and you could still, but we like to call them storm drains now uh, so to let people know that they are not treated like our sewer system. Okay. So anything that goes down your drains in your home, that will end up in our sewer system, our okay. sanitary sewer system, that will get treated before it gets discharged to the Big Sioux River. But anything that goes down our storm drains doesn't. So they, they are very different. It's not a sewer system. Do they all come out at the same spot? Uh, nope. They'll, they'll be discharged in different areas around the city, but eventually they will all lead to the Big Sioux River. Because if we didn't have these... They're kind of like flash, there's always little flash floods whenever we have these big downpours. Yes. And this protects us all. Yep, they're vital for public health. They're a really important part of our infrastructure, um, but we're also treating them as a canvas to promote messages about water quality too. And I, I love art. Yes. I love art and I love that everybody is welcome. How can people sign up or, or send you their ideas? Yeah, so they have until May 14th this year. Okay. Uh, submit your colored design. has to be colored and completed to me via my email um, and we can put that on the on the video. Um, but they'll submit their designs to me. We actually will bring these to the Visual Arts Commission. They're a partner with us in this project. Wonderful. And they will select the five winning designs. Um, after that, we'll pick a date in June, weather permitting, and the artist will get to go out and paint their designs. A sump pump can be your first line of defense against getting water in your basement. Don't wait until it's too late to verify your sump pump is working properly. Make sure your hose discharges into your yard, away from your house, or into a stormwater or sump pump collection system. Never discharge into a sink, toilet, shower, or floor drain. Also, consider a backup system in case your home loses power. For more information, go to the city's website at siouxfalls.org slash sump pump. My hero is my neighbor because she rakes the lawn for me when I can't. She's always there whenever anyone needs a helping hand. My teacher is my hero because she always makes time for everyone. Welcome back everybody. Springtime is an important time to make sure your sump pump's working. Let's listen to Andy Berg as he explains all about it. Hi, I'm Andy Berg with the City of Sioux Falls Public Works Department. Today we're here to talk to you about sump pumps. Most homes that have basements have a sump pump system in them. The sump pump's job is to collect storm water from around the foundation drains and pump it outside of your house to keep water from getting into your basement. The groundwater that accumulates is then pumped outside into your lawn, into a stormwater piping system, or into a sump pump collection system. The system we have here is this collection system that pipes the water to the outside of the house. Homeowners need to be conscious of where that water goes once it's outside the house. If a pipe discharges too close to the house itself, the water will drain back down along the foundations and be recycled back into their sump pump pit again. It is important that they have a long enough hose to get that water away from the house and that they also monitor where that pump is putting the water out in that yard so that the area doesn't become a nuisance with the soggy wet ground that mosquitoes could accumulate in or cause uh, nuisance for the neighbors. So it's important if you do have your hose discharging to your lawn that you take good care of it and move it occasionally to not be a nuisance to your neighbors or the neighborhood. We recommend anyone who has a sump pump collection system adjacent to their home that they use it. This is a great resource. It helps keep water out of lawns. It also keeps folks from discharging that water across the sidewalks and out into the street where it can cause icing issues during the cold season. And in the summer, it can create a slippery film of algae that is also a very much a hazard. Another thing we don't want to see is folks putting the hoses out across sidewalks or onto their driveways where they could become a, a tripping hazard. Another thing that we strongly recommend for sump pump users is a backup system. The one we have here is a battery backup system. This is a great insurance policy for those folks whose sump pumps run regularly. 
There are two important collection systems that serve homes in our city. The stormwater collection system and the sanitary sewer collection system. The stormwater collection system is what collects all of the rain and groundwater and runoff from snow melt and collects it into a stormwater inlet in your curving gutters, down into pipes, through drainage ways and channels, into ponds, and eventually to the Big Sioux River. This is the system that we want folks to connect their sump pumps to. Whether it's pumping into their yards, which flows to a ditch or a channel, or pumping directly into a sump pump collection system or stormwater system, that's the preferred collection point. If folks connect their sump pumps into the sanitary sewer collection system through either a toilet, a sink, a shower, or their floor drain in their basement, that is not allowed. That is against city ordinance and could have catastrophic effects to both yourself, your home, and also your neighbor's homes. The sanitary sewer collection system is not sized to handle those additional flows. Those flows from a sump pump can inundate a sanitary collection system and cause sewage backups into either your home or your neighbor's home. So please be sure to have your sump pumps discharging to a stormwater collection system at all times. Okay. Thanks, Andy. You know, we all know the different elements that make up our EMS system, but do you know how they all work together? Here's Steve Fessler telling us all about it. Hi, this is Division Chief Steve Fessler with Sioux Falls Fire Rescue. And today I'm speaking with Dr. Jeff Luther. He's our medical director for the REMSA Re Regional Emergency Medical Services Authority. And I'd like to welcome you. Welcome. Thanks, Steve. Thanks for having nice, me. Nice to see you here today. Um, this, the month of May is, in, well, I should say towards the end of May is uh, EMS week. And as a community, we have quite a few different EMS partners that work together. And uh, can you tell us a little bit about those different partnerships and, and who's all involved and how it works for us? Uh, well, in our city, uh, we've got, uh, we're very fortunate in terms of um, the professionalism that we have. And there are several layers that uh, provide pre-hospital emergency care uh, within the city of Sioux Falls, also in the surrounding community. Um, as you know, the fire department is a very integral part of EMS in our community, as it is across the country. And in terms of first response, if we look at an episode where there is an emergency, we have a, a pretty sophisticated cascade uh, that starts with our 911 dispatch center. Mm -hmm. And our current 911 dispatch center then is set up in a system where they triage the call types. And based on that call type, uh, who gets dispatched. Now, if we look at our most emergent or life threat types of situations, everyone goes. So a caller will call 911, uh, the call is processed, and then the resources are dispatched. And if it's, for example, a cardiac arrest call, um, police department is dispatched, as you know, fire department is, and um, also our ambulance provider is dispatched. Um, in our system, all of these systems work together. And in fact, uh, we meet on a regular basis and uh, we have a collaborative process where we do our quality assurance um, um, uh, a system. Uh, as you know, you're, you're a, a part of that. Um, so we have uh, the ability to review calls almost as they happen mm -hmm. with our technology that we've got. Uh, as soon as the call is dispatched and all systems that are dispatched are responding, we're able to track those, if you will, to see um, times of uh, arrival to the patient. And again, depending on the nature of the incident, we look at all sorts of um, different quality assurance or quality performance indicators. For mm -hmm. example, scene times uh, in your trauma patient, we try and minimize those. And also we look at, um, in medical calls, what can be provided on site. And that's through a set of guidelines and protocols that are developed in our system that are consistent with best practice standards. Uh, those are all evidence-based. Um, I'm very proud of that part of this community. Uh, my role as a medical director is to uh, assist all of the agencies involved um, into 
establishing our guidelines, uh, assessing those guidelines in terms of their success through a QA process. Um, I've got lots of resources behind me that, um, that, that should be mentioned because they make my job a lot easier. But with the technology today and how we're able to uh, process the quality assurance measures in EMS is pretty remarkable, Steve. So, yeah. And it, it helps the whole system work together. All the partners are able to, to come together, work as one, and have the best possible EMS system for our city. Absolutely, and that's, that's part of the beauty of this, is a, is a collaboration. Um, we do frequent multi-agency reviews. Uh, I think all agencies talk to themselves. There's a lot of um, uh, back and forth communication, and which is very critical. And again, it's almost real time. Uh, as soon as the reports are generated, uh, I can get those uploaded and reviewed. Uh, not only just uh, if there's our issues, but also on the good calls, because we learn from them as much as we do in any review process. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Luther. We appreciate the time. and. Uh, if you'd like to learn more about Sioux Falls Fire Rescue, go to www.siouxfalls.org slash fire. Thanks, Steve. Did you know that May is National Bike Month? Sioux Falls has a wonderful cycling community. Here's Mary Michaels to tell us what the city can do for all our bicycle riders. Hi, I'm Mary Michaels with Live Well Sioux Falls, and we are celebrating Bike Month. Spring is finally here and people are getting outdoors, so we're going to talk about everything you need to know about getting out and riding your bike safely this spring and summer. And with me today is Michael Christensen, who is the president of Falls Area Bicyclists. So Mike, now that people are out and about, what are some of the safety tips that people really need to be thinking about as they're getting their bikes out for the season? So the most important safety thing is bicycle helmet. We really push those. Everybody should wear a helmet. I wear a helmet all the time when I ride. Um, that's your basic protection if you're falling off. Um, so we start there. We move on from there for other personal safety devices, uh, wearing sunglasses and gloves. Um, sunglasses because it's hard to ride if a bug flies in your eye and you can't see. And gloves, if you do fall, just like the helmet protects your head, the gloves protect your hands because you tend to put your hands out when you're falling down. And what about as we think about early morning hours or evening hours and, and you know, what about like reflectors or lights? Those are also important pieces of safety, right? Yeah, uh, white front light, red tail light um, in, in the dark when it, well after sunset. That's a legal requirement for riding at night. And really most crashes happen in the evening when the light is low. So having those lights are pretty important if you're going to ride into the evening. And speaking of crashes, obviously safety on the, the road is an important part of bicycling. So what is that relationship between bicycles and cars? So where should bike bikes ride and, and what should cars and bicycles do to be able to share the road together? So for bicyclists, I say ride in the lane as if you're a vehicle when it's appropriate. Um, because a driver knows how to react to something in the roadway. Um, a driver knows how to react to another vehicle in the roadway. So if you're behaving like a vehicle, turn signals, the works like that, um, drivers know better how to, how to react to your position and they can see you better. So riding predictably is the best way to ride. Um, so that's straight line, paying attention to what's around you, using your turn signals. Can you demonstrate? So for left turn, we're extending our left arm straight out. And for right turns, you can either crook your arm like this, or now you can also extend your right arm this way. And personal preference kind of on that. Um, I prefer this way because it tends to point in the direction that I'm going. Also, you want to signal traffic when you're going to stop. So what is the signal if you're coming to a stop? Yeah, the signal for stopping or slowing is the left arm kind of down at an angle and with the palm facing behind. So biking can be a great social builder. You're out with families and friends. Um, efficient, as you mentioned, you can get around town a little quicker. But we also know there's health benefits to biking. And bicycling, and I read recently that individuals who bicycle three hours a week are less likely to have heart attack and stroke that they can actually decrease their risk by up to 50%. And people can find an interactive map of our bike trail on the city's website at SiouxFalls.org. So what would be your last pieces of advice if people are just getting out for the spring and summer and or maybe haven't really tried bicycling or bike commuting before? 
There's a great bike group in town called Falls Area Bicyclists, um, and they have all sorts of different rides. They have rides from road rides out in the country on the highways to rides around in the city. Um, and there's the rides in the city are always nicely paced. And so to, to get in, in a group of people like that who know how to get places, can see the road, know. When you ride with those people, you learn the local roads that are nice to ride on. Um, and, and lots of those rides are focused on going from place to place. As always, thank you so much for watching this month's City Scene. If you feel you missed anything or you want to watch it once again, visit SiouxFalls.org or check us out on our YouTube channel. Hope to see you next month. Bye-bye.